Hi, welcome to Hotels 101, a podcast that dives into the world of hospitality, travel, and leisure by looking at the lives of the people who live and breathe it every day. I'm your host, Rob Hayes. I'm the CEO and president of Ashford Hospitality Trust, a hotel company that owns assets, hotel assets all across the United States of America. And today's a very special episode. It's our sixth episode. And today we are going to be talking with the man who brought me into the hotel business 20-something years ago, Monty Bennett, the uh, chairman and CEO of Ashford, Inc. Welcome to Hotels 101. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a question to start out. And how come I made number six in your lineup and not number one? That is a great question. It We're really trying to build momentum, right? Because you just never know after the first few episodes if it's going to work. And then once you figure out the magic, then you bring on the real That's guests. very thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, that you're here. Thoughtful. Now, you've been... Uh, you haven't just been in the hotel industry a decade or two. You've been in the hotel industry, in a sense, your entire life. That's right. So give us a little bit of the, that background. How have you been involved in hotels? And I know your family has been involved. Uh, so give us a little bit of the background story of, of Monty. Sure. My, uh, my father kind of fell into it uh, back in the 60s um, through a series of events. And he started off with a hotel down in Galveston, Texas. And uh, he did very well, built a number of hotels, built a great company. And so as I grew up, I was born in 65, uh, I grew up in the industry and seeing the industry and my father being a prominent player in the industry. And um, um, when it was time to go off to college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and hotel business sounded as good as anything. And so myself and my identical twin brother, we both applied and were accepted to Cornell's hotel school. And so, we went up there and went to hotel school. He went into full-time ministry afterwards, and I went to work with my father. Well, as it turned out, uh, the Southwest was in a terrible recession at the time, and he'd gone through very tough times and was starting over. And so I joined him in 89 when he was starting over, and uh, we started working together in the hotel business. And we worked together for a decade or more, and then I went off and started launching some of these public platforms. He served on the board for a while, but then ultimately uh, rotated off. And uh, during that period, uh, we started off as a hotel management company, at least when I joined the firm in 88, 89 rather. And uh, then we bought a bunch of hotels from the RTC, more hotels than anybody else in the country, bought a bunch of other hotels as well, sold a lot of them. Um, launched uh, Ashford Hospitality Trust in uh, 2003, in August, and uh, grew that for a while, then spun out Braemar Hotels and Resorts, spun out to Ashford Inc., and started to grow those platforms, then merged in a couple of private companies. So we've been busy, all almost exclusively around the hotel space. And so when you started, so I joined the company 18, almost 19 years ago as an analyst, worked my way up eventually, became a CEO a few years ago. When you started out, what, what was your first job within the hotel space? I was, um, I forget which was my first, and they switched shortly thereafter. I either started as a director of information systems, IT, or as operations analyst, and then went to the other position. I forget which one was which. I think uh, IT was first for me. And so what was what were the, the lessons that you learned in kind of starting out as a young guy in your first kind of job in the hotel space? I think just not take things too seriously. It seems like uh, uh, when I see people out in the world, myself included, you have people that are either just not motivated at all to do much, and unfortunately they don't accomplish a lot in their lives, or people that are very, very motivated, as I was, but they kind of get ahead of themselves and they kind of rush and there's no need to rush, just work hard and uh, good things will happen to you, uh, especially in this industry and just be patient. Gotcha. Well, so one of the things that we do here on Hotels 101 is we'll kind of rotate between some personal questions, some professional, you know, uh, personal and professional questions. Uh, so you've talked a little bit about your background in the hotels, which you've spent most of your life in. What do you do to kind of get out of that space? What do you do in terms of you have passion projects, things that you do outside of the office that kind of drive you, interest you? I've got three things that I do. And uh, the third one is more involved, and you might want to split that up depending on how you want to do your <laughs> podcast. But 
The first here recently is I've tried to develop my faith more, and I've tried to uh, read the Bible more and to pray more often, and so that's an area of my life I'm trying to develop more. And then I like to spend time with my family and uh, my wife. Uh, we've got three 10-year-olds and a seven-year-old, and I enjoy spending time with them and going out to our ranch out in East Texas. And we've got a beautiful place out there, built a home out there about five years ago, just built a lake, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It is rolling hills, lots of water, lots of vegetation and trees and oak trees and all kinds of other trees. And I go out there just about every weekend. It's tough to get me to go anyplace else. So just love it. And uh, the third is uh, things that I'm, I'm involved in and enjoy is getting really involved with the city here. And I've launched a, a number of initiatives to try and make this city a, a better place. Unfortunately, American cities have been going like this over the past five, 10 years, and they're getting worse and worse places to live. And I thought Dallas was not too far down that path that it could be changed and uh, that, that that curve could have an inflection point where it doesn't follow the same path as so many other American cities that are almost unlivable at this point. And so I've dedicated a lot of time doing that, including uh, one thing uh, I've started is I launched my own newspaper and it's called the Dallas Express, it's a nonprofit. And the impetus behind that was, if you're gonna to try to change a city, you need media and media that's even handed. And so much of the media is just so far left or so far right. Um, I just wanted to produce something that on every story of any controversy, we always have quotes from one side or the other. And we try not to have our reporters put their opinions in anything not always successful, but we do it more than any other publication that I know of about putting both sides into issues of any controversy. And uh, so we've been doing that for two and a half years now, have got uh, great readership. We put out 30 articles a day and it's really just local news mainly, uh, state news and national news. And so if you're a really heavy news junkie, you'll wanna go to a bunch of other news sources as well. But if you just wanna know kind of what's going on in your city and uh, and then nationally and internationally, just kind of superficially, uh, this is a good publication uh, for you. It just kind of keeps you informed. And uh, with it, we can talk about the problems of the city and what to do about it and hear voices about how to uh, solve these problems and the like. Uh, so we've got something like um, 250,000 subscribers. Mm. And uh, I think the Dallas Morning News only has 60,000 subscribers, our main competitor. Now in fairness, you have to pay for theirs. Ours is free but it does show you how much influence and reach we've already been able to achieve in just a few years. And these are focused kind of on topics of crime and homelessness and schools and kind of the things that citizens would kind of typically care about to have their city function in a healthy way? You bet. And it's interesting because in our own business, um, one of the parts I think that's been so interesting coming out of COVID is just the, the massive disparity in how different cities have recovered. And the part that we've seen in, in a lot of our hotels particularly in some cities, I imagine like the ones you're mentioning, um, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, those assets are probably worth somewhere between 50 and 80% of what they were worth pre-COVID and their revenues and, and EBITDA is only back 60, 70, 80%. And there's a lot of it has to do with some of these broader, more political issues, which people are always hesitant to get into, is this a Republican thing or a Democrat thing? And it seems like the issues you're talking about are not partisan issues. These are just people want their schools to be good. They want their crime to be low. They want homelessness to be dealt with in a, in a right way. Is, is that right? Is that kind of They're quality about? of life issues. The, the partisanship part comes in when you start pursuing solutions. And if you start pursuing a solution that someone perceives as left wing, and you're pursuing with someone that's right wing, well, they don't like it and vice versa. And that's where it gets a little challenging. And the way we try to approach it is we don't care what wing it is. We just want to fix it. And so if it's a left wing solution that fixes it, great. If it's a right wing, great. We don't care. We just want cities to be safe. We want people to be able to enjoy cities. We want people to move to cities. We want cities to have great education systems, to have nice parks, and for those parks to be clean and the streets to be clean, and our homeless population to be taken care of in the right way and getting them the help they need, but also not letting them take over a whole city so then the city is not livable for everybody else. So these are the kind of uh, 
of problems that in my spare time I'm working to uh, to address. Gotcha. So what do you hope for, uh, and, and kind of going back to the professional side, what do you hope for your companies over the next three to five years, right? You've, you've, you've kind of built this structure. You've got a variety of, of public companies that you, that you oversee. What does the future look like? Is it just in hotels? Is it going to other property types? And what's the, the, the bigger vision of what you're trying to accomplish? Well, a number of years ago, we were just in hotel real estate. And then we branched out because it's tough to grow when you own just real estate because it requires so much capital to grow. And you need to bring in outside capital and terms come with that capital. Um, where if you're an operating company, you can usually use retained earnings to grow. So we pivot into also owning a number of hospitality focused companies, uh, such as an audiovisual company, such as a property management company, an asset management company, all hotel focused, renovation development company, so that we could grow with retained earnings. And that's what Ashford Inc. really is. It does all kinds of hotel services and products that it provides both to these managed REITs Ashford Hospitality Trust in Braemar, as well as to other hotel owners around the country. So continuing to grow that platform and to get into the services business is exciting and we're looking forward to, as well as grow our hotel portfolio in those platforms and otherwise. And I'm also starting to transition and to diversify into other real estate types. Uh, each recession, I tell myself that it couldn't possibly <laughs> get worse for hotels than the recession we were just through. And it got worse and it happened again and again. So I finally have given up and I said, I've got to be in other property types because COVID was very, very difficult, as you well know, for our companies and for hotels and for our people uh, and for us and for our families. And so I'm trying to diversify to get into other property types. So we've launched a little fund to do that and we'll, we're going to be doing more of that. Gotcha. So stepping back a little bit bigger picture is in this process, and, and like I said, there've been good times and difficult times. Has there been a, a particular piece of you know, business advice, personal advice that you got either from a family member, from a colleague, that's something that's stuck with you as, as something you kind of rest upon as you're trying to manage these businesses and, and, and go forward? Well, what I mentioned earlier about um, work hard but relax um, is, is something that I, I think is a very valuable uh, piece of advice. Um, and something else that I've learned, I tell myself, is uh, that uh, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, whatever you've been through, and this includes in personal uh, matters as well, is that everything always, always, almost always turns out for the better. In the past, some things that happened, which I thought were the absolute worst things that were terrible in this case I'm thinking about for my business, uh, turned out to be one of the best things for my business. And there's no way I could have seen it at the time. And at the time, I couldn't even think that it'd be okay, much less one of the best things that happened for our business. So don't get too worked up or too down if you have a setback. Many times it works out that it's far better that that setback happened. Well, I remember when, when you called me uh, to talk to me about potentially stepping into the role of CEO during COVID. And I think I mentioned to you, I talked to my father about, about it was a, something that I should be doing. And his response to me was that he was envious of, of me having the opportunity to go through COVID in the hotel business. And I was thinking, dad, you've lost your mind. It's, it was awful. It was terrible. So many bad things are happening. And his response to me was something like, well, you can't learn that in a book, right? The only way that you can learn is by going through it even if it's hard. And so there is this kind of silver lining of, man, it was hard and you don't want to go through difficult things. But if you look at the right way, you come out of it and you could say, well, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was terrible. It's worlds of wisdom. And your father is a very wise man, as you well know. Uh, and it's the hard lessons, but you learn a lot. So when you, uh, one of the questions we try to ask some of our, our guests here is, uh, you can go anywhere in the world. Uh, you're on vacation. I think when I talked with Jay Steigerwald a few weeks ago, it was, Jay, you're on your deathbed. You can only go one more place, but we won't do that. We'll just say you can go anywhere on vacation. What's your favorite hotel? It can be one of yours. It can be not one of yours. Best hotel you've been in or favorite well, to go to? Well, those are a little bit different yeah. because I wouldn't go to one of our hotels 
even though we've got some fantastic hotels. And that is because um, I get fussed over a lot. And our people are great, as you well know, and great service. But when I'm there, they're in the hospitality business. They want to make sure everything's okay. And so it's hard for me to relax, both because the staff is fussing over me. And I don't want them to fuss. I want them just to be able to do their jobs. And it's tense for them too, right? To have people in town and, and, uh, and makes life a little more tense for them. So I don't want to put them through that either. So I think some of our hotels, like uh, the one we have in Puerto Rico, is absolutely beautiful, spectacular, beautiful. Uh, I went to the one in uh, La Posada in Santa Fe the other day, and the service there that Remington mm -hmm. managed was absolutely spectacular. I mean, just spectacular. But I would go to not one of our managed hotels for that reason, or owned hotels. And as far as which one, I don't know. There's so many beautiful hotels, either because of their design, or fantastic service, or their location, uh, the scenery around them. Some of them have just extraordinary history. I couldn't choose. I don't know. I'd probably let my wife choose and we'd go someplace. <laughs> because you typically a pretty good answer. <laughs> yes, because uh, there's so many that are so neat. So one other question I had for you, because I think it's something that uh, I've heard you talk about before, and uh, maybe given your, your IT background when you were a young, young kid, um, our industry is being changed a lot by technology. And I think we're fortunate in that, in one sense, our, our assets are not obsolete, right? There's a lot of real estate property types where right now the future of office, what does that mean? The future of malls, what does that mean? We're at least in a business where, particularly on the heels of COVID, people want to travel, they want to go to places, and so they're not obsolete in that sense. But technology's coming fast, and it's going to impact our business in a big way. So as you're thinking about that in, in growing Ashford Inc. over the next three to five years, how are you thinking about technology? What does that mean? What are the opportunities? What are the, are the risks? Well, technology in our business has usually come in in a way to allow us to save on labor costs. And that's how productivity comes, is you become more efficient, usually by technology, and so your labor costs aren't as high. And so the number of people working at hotels is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because of these efficiencies. And that's something you really can't avoid because as an economy advances and people become more expensive, well, you have to have less of them. You have to make do with them. What would be nice is to have more technology that actually enhances the guest experience or make it a, a better, more fun, enjoyable time. And there's a few pieces of technology that do that. Then there's technology that arguably hurts our business, like Zoom or Microsoft Teams, which people will do in lieu of traveling to go see someone. Or if any of this virtual reality ever takes off, where those uh, uh, face masks are something that people enjoy. But right now, people aren't even close to it. And people love to travel. They just love it. And they love to experience everything. So I think you're going to see a trend of relatively more travel on the leisure side and less so on the uh, on the business side, corporate side, you'll probably still see group hanging in there pretty good because corporations and associations like to get people together for the social aspect. So you'll see that part of it. I think COVID accelerated a trend that was happening, which was less individual business travel and more leisure travels. I think accelerated that. And I think you'll see more of that, more resorts build as people just enjoy traveling. And um, there's aspects of technology that helps that, right? It's Booking's a little bit easier. Getting a hold of someone there to help you with the uh, hotel is easier. Um, booking excursions and the like there is easier. Uh, but our business is one of a personal touch. And in the end, at least for now and for the short term future, to have really great service, you need people and you need good trained people. Great. Well, maybe as a, as a last question, touching on that point is uh, our whole industry and a lot of industries have, have struggled on the back side of COVID, trying to recruit new people, get people in the industry, train them up. We're now competing against the gig economy and Amazon and all these people. And they offer a certain amount of, seems like flexibility, but there's probably also a detriment maybe to their long-term career. What's the pitch that you would make to somebody, a young person out there that's saying, I, I'm thinking about the hospitality industry. I don't know if I should do it. Why or why not? What's, what would you tell someone that's thinking about this industry? It's fun. It's fun. Uh, there are some industries like tech 
if you're very good at it, you can do better financially. Um, but financial, the financial part is not everything. And whether you go to work for a hotel, and I've worked in hotels, and it's fun. You're with a group of people, and you're helping other people. And even at our industry conferences, as you well know, our conferences, I, I learned this maybe, maybe 10, 20 years into my career, they're not like the conferences of other industries. In other industries, people are competitors and, and they're much, uh, have much sharper elbows. But in our conferences, all the competitors, we sit around, we talk, we're friends, we smoke a cigar, we have fun together. And so we're competitors, but we're friendly competitors. And that's how our industry is. You don't see that in other industries. It's just more hard nosed. Uh, and uh, a lot of people that especially like to serve others, this is a great industry because that's what you're doing. You're in the hospitality business and you're taking care of other people. And if you like people, this is the industry for you. Well, and I think it, another aspect as well is that it's, uh, it's flexible in that just about anything that you like, anything that you're good at, there's a place for it in our space, whether it's on the financial side or the deal side or the sales side, the technology side, there's a, a part of this industry that you can probably be very successful in. That's right. Um, and there's the benefits of it's always nice to go travel to hotels and, and be a part of it. So, right. um, well, with that, Monty, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been great talking to you. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I saved the sixth spot. It was just for you. It was, it's, you. We built up. Well, thank you for this wonderful mug. Yes, we I'm have flattered. the flattered hotels that is, 101. That is the seventh hotels 101 mug in existence. So that is a treasure <laughs> that uh, hopefully you'll keep for some. I will. I will treasure it. Thank you, Rob. Great. Being All right. Here. So thanks everybody for joining us for the sixth episode of Hotels 101, and I look forward to seeing you guys at the next episode. We'll talk soon.